Okay, so hello, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and welcome to the session of Sonoikis Digital Classics uh, Summer Semester 2019. Uh, today, as announced last week, we have our session about digital methods and ancient magic. And um, our guests today are Gabriel Bodar from the Institute of Classical Studies in London and Francisca Nether, she's with me, from the University of Leipzig and Stellenbosch University. So we have two experts of ancient magic and today you have uh, uh, the class uh, outline on GitHub with a description of the session. You also have readings, um, exer an exercise, and then we are going also to add the, the link to our uh, slides. And so today um, we will have many, many questions because the session is about, uh, well, uh, magic in the ancient world, in different uh, cultures in the ancient world, and then how uh, we can use digital methods for studying ancient magic. So, Gabriel and uh, Francisca, welcome back to Synoikesis. <laughs> and so we start with Francisca, she's with me in my office. And so we can start and let me share um, the screen. Okay, and I start the presentation. Okay. Francisca. Hello everyone, and thank you, Monica. It's always a pleasure to return to Zenoikis. Hello from Leipzig, everyone. I'm going to start first with a little outline of our session today. And what we are going to talk about is first, since this is such a special topic, what is magic? What do we view today as magic? How did the ancient define it? If we have definitions from the ancient world, this is of course a very tricky issue. And how did scholars of past periods address this issue of defining magic? After this, Gabi will also share a couple of insight that he has from his own research on magical texts and magical objects. And then we will interact a little bit in discussion with you. Further on, and on our second bullet point, I will explain to you a project that, that I have been involved with in the, in the past. This is Trismegistus Magic. This is a sub branch of the Trismegistus database that we have presented now a couple of times in Synoikesis. And then we will move on to a couple of examples that basically Gabi will present us from his area of expertise. The magical texts and the magical objects that we are going to present come from, we can say, the whole of the ancient world, from ancient Egypt, from Roman Britain, from Cyprus. So stay tuned for a really exciting session with a lot of material, a lot of curses, blessings, spells on metal, on papyrus, or even other surfaces will be mentioned in different languages. So this is going to be a plethora of different sources. And finally, we will we'll come back to our further readings, give you some links. And if you're inclined to, we will explain what the exercise of today's session will be about. So first of all, what is magic? I usually start this question from modern pop culture, and it's of course a classic to return to JK Rowling and the Harry Potter novels or the Wizard of Oz. And I guess you in the audience and you who's going to watch this are able to enumerate a lot many more examples where magic is coming up in modern movies, in computer games, in literature, but not just in the contemporary time in nowadays movie theaters, but also in literature and films, which are a lot older, and we can even go back to the ancient world. I've put you on the slide a picture of a papyrus from the British Library, that's not a ghetto, but a papyrus um, from the British Museum, of the ancient tale of Setna, or the so-called second Setna novel. This is a story about Pharaoh Ramsey's son, who is a very accomplished priest, but also a magician, and at the same time, the king's son, so he has special powers. And the story is basically centered around a lot of magical techniques. He's then fighting in a duel against another wizard from Nubia. And this is, these are very 
exciting stories to keep, and the magic is there to keep the history going. Another picture I brought you on this slide is a folded curse tablet from Roman Britain, and this time from Bath, where we have a big corpus of sources of, of curses that have been found in the, in the bath of the temple of the goddess Sulis Minerva in Britain. What all these stories have in common, those works of literature, that is basically that the superheroes in these stories who are able to do magic could do this because they are destined to be a superhero, they are a wizard by birth, and this is why they have these superpowers, and then the whole story is evolves around them. So there's a, there are a lot of similarities in this literary text. Something that is always seen as a dichotomy on viewing magic is, is magic part of religion, of an institutionalized religion, or is it an evil or forbidden counterpart of religion? Sometimes people have viewed magic as well as early science, as the roots, what we see today as chemistry, astronomy, and medicine. So there are these three ideas. Magic is part of religion. Magic is counterpart of religion, the evil twin, so to say. Or magic is early science. Keep that in mind when we continue the discussion. In some Western societies today, we see a decline of religion, especially in uh, Christianity in the Northern Hemisphere versus rise of religions. As one example, I can bring you the rise of Islam in Southeast Asia nowadays. But apart from that, spiritual practices always continue. They run sometimes deeper than religious practices. Those spiritual ritual practices can have a very strong hold in the society to keep them together. Praying and cursing from a, a social religious point of view, or a linguistic point of view, are very closely together. And the belief in general supernatural forces might, of course, not be tied to an official religion or an institutionalized cult. Today, I brought you one example of a genre that is, I would say, very prominent for magical text, curses. There's a couple hundred curses that are transmitted from the ancient world, maybe even thousands. Not everything is published so far. There's a lot of things in, in archives. And one of the most famous curses is the so-called Curse of Artemisia from an Egyptian papyrus now stored in the Papyrus Museum in Vienna, in the Hofburg. And it's part of one of our best-known magical corpora of the ancient world, the so-called Papyri Graeke Magicae, or PGM for the initiated. This was a corpus that was founded by Friedrich Preisendam, so it's not an ancient corpus, it's a modern corpus. It's actually two books that Preisendam put together in 1928 until 1931. And once again, Albert Henrich, the scholar, late Albert Henrich uh, from uh, Harvard University, worked on this from 1973 to 1974. And their edition is what we have nowadays, what constitute this, these papyri Greke magicae. And this is one out of it. A lot of these, these papyri, magical papyri also contain divination, so something which we wouldn't actually define strictly as magic. But as you can see, this is a pretty, there are pretty fuzzy boundaries. The papyrus itself is from the 4th century BC. And have a look at the letters, have a look at the paleography. This doesn't, if, if you have seen papyri before or not, then I tell you this doesn't strike one as a letter hand, as an experienced hand. A lot of people have argued that Artemisia, the woman who is the subject of that letter, has written it herself in a very unexperienced hand. It's sometimes called an epigraphic style because it looks a little bit like an like a Greek inscription, not something you find in papyrus. It's coming from Memphis, it's quite fragmentary. And now when we're going to have a look into the texts, and I bring you a translation from Jane Rawlinson and Roger Bagnall's handbook on women in society in Greek and Roman, each of you can see that it's written from her perspective. And it's always important to ask who is speaking to whom, who is conveying which information in order to find a good definition of the magic. For whom is it benevolent? For whom is it malevolent? What we can see here, and I'm not going to read it out here, you can just follow it on the slides. In the document, the woman Artemisia, about whom we know nothing at all except from this document, she's appealing to the Greco-Egyptian god 
Oserapis or Osiris Apis at that time to punish the father of her daughter. Uh, you can see that in the second line, she's not writing my husband or anything else or my lover, the father of her daughter. So the reason is the father of her daughter, <clears throat> sorry, is depriving the child, the funeral, the funerary rites and the burial. So she is appealing to Osirapis that the God is not granting the father of her daughter a burial as well. So this is her curse. This is what she tries to inflict as a punishment on the man. So what we have here is more or less curse, which is not really different to a prayer in which she is trying to bring the God's wrath on her behalf, on her lover or on her husband or former husband. It's pretty, it's a pretty drastic formulation. It's not so formulary and, and as we have, as we can find in other curses. And her drastic words are a striking example for the great importance that was put in Greco Roman Egypt on the funeral rites for Egyptians as well as for her who might come from a more Greek Macedonian background here. There's a couple of similar texts that we know. Maybe you heard of judicial prayers or prayers for justice, self dedications, hero jewelry contracts. So there's a couple of different genres who actually make use of the same form of cursing and using this magical language. Maybe you also heard of letters to gods. Those are appeals that people had to divinities when they were in great dangers, when legal method, methods, legal measures wouldn't apply for these people when they maybe have tried to go to court, tried to go to lawyers, but they couldn't help them. So they went to the gods as their last resort. If you are more interested in those genres, there's just then the place in the in the discussion section to ask about it. There's quite a lot to say and there was quite a lot of new research on those prayers for justice and those kind of curses. Now coming back to magic itself and trying to find a definition, I have to say here in Leipzig this has been quite some, some part of our research that we do in Egyptology and in ancient history and going starting off from an article by Thomas Schneider called Die Waffe der Analogie this scheme is something that we use a lot in teaching and in research so that magic could be roughly distinguished into four categories. Preventive magic, like trying not to get sick, for instance, having spells for not getting the plague or any other, other disease or not being cursed. Reactive magic, this is of course what happens when you have been struck with a curse or, or a sickness trying to heal all the kind of medical and healing spells fall under this category. Transformative magic, this is for instance when someone tries to be invisible or tries to be another person. <clears throat> and investigative magic, investigatory magic, this is actually the same what we can, what we also call divination or mantike. This is trying out, trying to find out things that will happen in the future that have happened in the past when you haven't been present and you want to find out who, for instance, has stolen something and using oracles and other techniques for all of these things. So I found this a very broad but also a very helpful approach to define magic. And you can put all the different genres that we find in at least one or two of these categories. I also made a little drawing once for for a presentation where I was speaking about healers and how the healers take the position of divinities in times when they heal. So in this really roughly sketch, you can see on the right hand part of the slide, the practitioner, which I just coded randomly as the hieroglyph for male with the hand on his mouth. So the practitioner is usually a priest or a healer or a wandering person, an intermediate who is interacting with the practitioner randomly coded in the hieroglyph of a woman next to him. They both have to communicate what's the issue of the practitioner and the practitioner is then able to find the proper magical method. He's also able to put things into writing if writing is a means what you need, for instance, to draft an oracle, to draft a magical spell. So when they communicate it in their little microcosm, the the practitioner is stepping up in his position in, in this divine role for the practitioner and has a lot of rhetorics that are protecting him like a shield. That's why I put this in this yellow shield form. 
when he is interacting in the microcosm with the gods, randomly represented on the left-hand slide, side of the slide as the god Thoth, the Egyptian god of magic. The practitioner sometimes utters a lot of threats, punishments, and menaces against the god, like, if you don't help my petitioner, then I will inflict this or that on you. So he's really menacing the gods, but he's putting a lot of rhetorical shields among that, saying, it is not I who is going to utter these threats, it's the disease or a demon within me. So you have these two layers of communication, usually, and this is an approach for defining magic or for finding working definitions of magic. So from, from a social religious point of view, this is a way of approaching magic, seeing religious actions, ritual actions, magical action within the framework of a communication system and having a look what is benefiting whom, which practice are malevolent to whom, rather than saying this is black magic, this is white magic, this is dark arts, and so on. So this is what I wanted to convey for definitions of magic. And now Gabi is on for telling us a little bit more from the definition that he found out while he was working on magical texts. Cool, thanks. Yeah, so um, what, what I'm going to talk about here, I'm just going to give very quickly um, four brief um, excerpts of text related to the definition of magic. Um, I'm going to start off with a couple of quotes that I um, that I'm going to I'm going to poke holes in effectively and show why why I disagree with and why they're not particularly helpful, um, and then I'm going to show the the definitions that I ended up with that I think are more helpful for my work. Um, I want to put two um, caveats on this. The first being that uh, my work is now 15 years out of date in the scholarship on magic, as I I, I, I finished my my work on magic. Um, quite some time ago. Um, and the second is that I was working on a very different field than um, Francisca. And so I think we will end up um, with definitions of magic that, um, you know, we will end up finding that we cannot agree on a definition of magic between between the two of us, um, which I think is is salutary in terms of demonstrating these, these definitions and the problems of them. So the first example I want to show um, is um, from a very early in terms of the the modern um, um, renaissance of, of magic scholarship. Um, this is uh, Georg Lutz Arcanamundi from 1985, who starts off talking about problems with earlier definitions and then talks about his own definition of magic. Um, and, you know, he summarizes as ultimately, you know, magic is a belief in the unlimited power of the soul. Um, and Basically, as he's talking about Greco-Roman magic, but his um, the book in which Arcana Mundi, in which he describes this, um, includes early Christian magic and um, and all sorts of um, other um, cultures and whatever. That are you know, lots and lots of changes have happened between you know Homer and Augustine or whatever. So. Um, but but most of the terms in his definition. Um, powers located in the human soul, the unlimited power of soul. These are things which, which are not, which are not in themselves defined um, across across this culture. So I think this this definition of magic is um, is almost useless in terms of understanding what we actually mean by it. A definition that says, okay, is this thing here magic or not? This this definition doesn't help us. I don't think. Um, the second definition I want to talk about is a much more recent one. This is a much more pragmatic definition, in some ways closer to where I would go. Um, this is Daniel Ogden's 2002 Magic, Witchcraft and Ghosts, um, where he effectively says that the definition he is going to use is that if, some, if, if something, a practice, is the kind of thing that appears in a book which has a word such as magic in the title, then he's going to include it in his study. Um, which um, he says this, you know, some people, some people will find this disappointing if they're of, of a more philosophical bent than that. I think that's the issue with it is not that it's not philosophical enough. The issue with it is that it is, from a scholarly point of view, completely circular. Um, we call it magic, therefore we're going to call it magic. And it, so, so this, 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 I think, doesn't help. And again, he's talking about a very long 
um, period of time. Um, and it's, you know, it's very hard to come up with any definition that will work both for Homer and for late antiquity. Um, so in my um, PhD um, dissertation, which I, again, finished over 15 years ago, so this, um, this, this comes with that caveat, um, I ended up concluding that magic is entirely or, or very, very heavily relative. Um, so the, the degree to which you can call magic um, in any way um, a less acceptable version of similar rituals that, that you would see in religious practice, you, you first have to ask less acceptable to who? Um, to the person who's doing it, to the person who's writing the text describing it, to the person who's the victim of it. You know, it, it becomes, um, you know, are you, is, is it a Greek person speaking, an Egyptian person speaking, a Christian person speaking? What are the... Um, you know what are the contexts in which you are um, you are describing this this um, text, and um, so as I as I um, as I ended up concluding, um, I I did see a um, an interesting spectrum of sanctioned as opposed to unsanctioned activities from religious and medicine. Um, you know, religious activity, official polis religion and medical activity by highly educated male citizen professionals on the one extreme and, you know, criminal activity and, um, you know, completely unacceptable activity on the other. And somewhere in between, you see activities that use some of the rhetoric of the um, religious and medical um, activities, but are not entirely socially comfortable. And that is around where we see magic popping up in that in that area um, and so um, so I'm not really interested in it in whether or not magic is part of religion or in a opposition to a religion whether it's scientific or unscientific um, I'm more interested in, in, in what where on these multiple spectra um, do, do the activities we're looking at sit um, and, and how do they become acceptable or unacceptable in that way um, and I would I would end this um, this part by saying that I'm sure that I, I therefore have come up with a definition of magic that Francisca doesn't agree with because the the concept of socially unacceptable is not a key part of the definition of magic in in Egypt right because because it's it's a different it's a different culture um, so maybe we could we could move on to uh, to arguing about that for a minute. Okay, so I share the screen. All right, here we go. And okay, okay, here we are. Right. Here we are. Yeah, thank you very much, Gavin, for um, for pointing these out. And and this is something which is true for a lot of people who work with ancient rituals, with ancient magic. We have read a lot of material. A lot mm -hmm. Um, scholars, ancient or modern scholars, or some scholars who are 200 years old, just doing some name dropping here, Georges Bataille, Marcel Moss, uh, Durkheim, Davy Strauss, Tambia, and a couple of field anthropologists such as Fraser, Evans Pritchard. And when I did this, of course, as many other people had as well, you come back to thinking that they tell you more about their society and their views of, for instance, Victorian England on African tribes or people in, in Oceania rather than about ancient magic or magic of the tribes themselves. So what is important and what Gabi already pointed out is that viewing things in, in context is important. Are the rituals part of the official cult or are they not? Have they been practiced by priests in temples or by official necromancers? Or was it something that people did illegally? And we have a couple of examples for both from different cultures of the ancient world. And we also have laws and, and juristic activity against magic. And something I have been also reading, as many people had, are the, the delict of the cream and magicae in law books such as the Corpus Juris Civilis, the Corpus Theodosianus. But unfortunately, this is not telling us much about what was sanctioned and what was unsanctioned because this could change even within the reign of one emperor. 
if you have a look at those law corpora, they are of course all available easily available online, open source. You can see that there are additions to the law books and sometimes how speak case reading the libraries are allowed and a few months later in the in the reign of Emperor Valentinian, they're not allowed anymore. So there is political will behind it. So the, the law side is not helping us for a definition and also not the definitions that we can find within the ancient cultures. I'd just like to name two examples that are always coming up in the literature. One is from Cicero in his book De Divinatione and one is from pa Plato in his dialogue Phaedron. And in both of the texts, both men try to find a definition and no, no, I'm, you're good. Both men try to find a definition and, and they define it from their culture and from the knowledge they have about their context. But this is something we cannot always understand nowadays because we don't know 100% all the steps that the ritual has. So it's very important to find at the end working definitions from the corpus that you have. Yeah, and I think I think so. One of the interesting things that I found when we're talking about um, perception and you know the, these relative definitions is that um, so for example the um, one of the definition one of the elements that comes up very often in in accusations of magic and I, I was working I should say on on early Greek um, uh, materials so so fourth century at the very very latest uh, BC um, so. Um, the, the things you see in accusations of magic, most of which are, are reports on them are much later, um, are um, attempts to present the accused as being foreign, as being um, un, uh, uh, unlicensed, as being um, in possession of secret um, knowledge. Um, especially if it's foreign knowledge, especially Egyptian or, or Babylonian knowledge that, um, that these people might have brought. Um, and, and this is a way, obviously, this, this doesn't necessarily tell us much about the origins of the magical practice themselves, because this is part of the, the legal rhetoric. This is how you, um, you besmirch somebody in the eyes of the jury that you're attempting to get to convict them. But by the same token, if you are an itinerant, maybe from another part of Greece, traveling um, around Attica with, um, you know, with, what's, with which, what, what is a foreign accent, um, although you're still Greek, um, and you are using your, um, the, the fact that you're a foreigner to build a reputation as a practitioner of magic, and you write curse tablets for people, and you claim to be able to deceive with the gods for them, and you claim to be able to heal them, and you claim to be able to sing you know, prayers and make things happen for them. Presenting yourself as foreign, presenting yourself as unsanctioned, because they've come to you because the sanctioned um, uh, activities haven't worked, um, or they're concerned they may not work, so they're coming to you for, for extra insurance. Um, presenting yourself as someone in possession of secret and unlicensed knowledge are all things that will make you seem more effective. So again, that appears in people's self-representation. I mean, we see that in the Greek magical papyri, although these are much later. I think we see, we, we see clues about that in, the, in some of the early curse tablets as well. Uh, people presenting themselves as foreign people, writing in these gibberish characters that don't look like Greek characters, because as far as we know, they're not characters at all. They're just there to make it look like they're writing in some mystical, magical language. Um, that doesn't necessarily tell us anything about the origin or nature of the magic either. That tells us about how they want that to be presented to their, um, to their um, petitioners. That's, their, um, that's the rhetoric of their, of their practice again. So, um, so we, we, we do have to be a little bit cautious about you know, saying magic is a foreign thing, except in as much as we believe magic, um, the important thing about magic is how people perceived it. And if people perceived it as a foreign thing, even if it wasn't, then that's that's maybe the most important part. But again, this works for fifth century BC Athens. Probably doesn't work for Pharaonic Egypt. Not all of it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not all of it. But as I said, it's important to see the dynamics of the communications in there. And as you mentioned, in um, Imperial Rome, we know now that a lot of magicians have been accused of being Egyptian, and of course they were. And this is all just a strategy of othering, as we call it in sociology. If you have an enemy 
and you want to harm him, what do you do? You just say you're not one of us because you do this, this, and this. And like you're Egyptian and you're a foreigner and you're using their practices. And yeah. but, be very careful. <laughs> but Avenue magicians also wandered around claiming to be Egyptian when they weren't, right? That's for exactly the same reason. <laughs> There was once um, the idea of not using the term magic at all because it's so problematic. It has a history in scholarship, especially what I pointed out in the in the 18th, 19th century. But and, and the idea was to use the term ritual practice. But the authors who tried to introduce that stepped back from this idea very quickly because, as problematic as the term magic may be, we know what we we actually know what kind of sources we are talking about. For instance, the magic of papyri from the third to sixth century CE. And what is important is being aware of that bias that the term itself has. Yeah, absolutely. So we come back to Ogden's definition, and um, and you know he's he's not wrong. It's just it's not it's not a definition at that point. Um, so um, as I see in. Uh, um, in the slide uh, where you uh, uh, cite yourself, Gabby, so you write, of course, we don't, for example, for ancient Greece, uh, we don't have a war in, uh, in classical Greece corresponding to magic. This is the usual right. problem when we use uh, contemporary uh, terms, and in this case, an English word referring to, to the ancient world. In this case, I'm referring to ancient. We said no for, for Egypt, but that's the thing. We don't have a war, so why it is also difficult for us to. We try to cover with this term many different practices and things uh, yeah, in different senses. Yeah. We should add, though, that as problematic as this is, um, and and as you know, Francisca and I both both agree, um, this is, and we have to be very careful about what we mean by the term, and, and you know, not reflecting our own values onto the onto the ancients. I think we do both believe that it's a useful term, and that there there is a fairly well understood, even if you know, permeous at the boundaries, um, body of texts, materials, activities, and beliefs that we can call magical. And, the, and that we're going to spend the rest of this hour, you know, talking about how we can approach um, digitally. I was said magically. Um, um, so, but so, so you know, I think there there is a fairly clear field of scholarship that, that that works on this. It's just one has to also be very very aware of that permeability. Yeah. No. Of course. I think as in other situations where we need a term, this is important for us, where we can uh, identify. Uh, corpus of text and then also many different ancient rituals and practices but that's the thing so we also have to be very careful about that but I agree we need that we need this term to to, to, to specify uh, what we are studying yes this is actually the perfect introduction to moving on to Trus Magistus okay. okay thank you Monica <laughs> sorry so I'm trying to okay now we um, share again the screen. So we love technology, but we also have to work a bit on it. Okay, so and then here again our slides so with uh, Trismegistos magic. When I was working for what is consider considered the second phase of the Trismegistos database from 2005 and 2008, I was responsible for one part of it which was not tied to a writing surface such as papyri or a genre just being documentary or language like Greek. I was responsible for something which is bringing together a couple of different languages, surfaces, and this was Trismegistus Magic. You can see the link on the slide um, on, the, on the lower part. It's part of the Trismegistus family and, and part of the text database. And at the left-hand slide I've given you an article which I wrote for the publication of the 10th International Congress of Egyptologists in 2008. You can download that for free and you might have already had a look at it as a preparation for this class. So within the framework of this second phase of Trismegistus, which happened in, in the University of Leuven and the University of Cologne, I collected 
around 3,000 published sources of what we call magical texts, but also with overlaps to religion, ritual, and divination. There is one thing which is important. All these sources are text-based sources, so there are no magical objects or wands or amulets in it that are not based on texts. So for, there's a lot of amulets which are not texts. Those are, for instance, scarabs or little figures. The thing for Trismegus is there has to be always some text on it. It's about writing surfaces. And when we started introducing TM Magic as a sub database of Trismegus, of course, we've been asking ourselves the same question that we've been discussing right now. How can we approach the creation of this database? What do we include and what not? And there was a lot of discussion in the team. And as I already mentioned, we couldn't base our definitions on the, the ancient cultures themselves on the law books they had, on the individuals such as Cicero or Plato, who gave a couple of, of uh, definitions because they were right for themselves and they give a period, but they don't say much to us our times. And also the modern dichotomies from the old literature was, was very problematic. So that's why we opted for this sociological or sociolinguistic approach. And then you can see what happens, what always happens if you have a certain corpus, then the definitions, of course, may vary. They might be, might be pretty broad, actually, uh, in terms of Trismegistus magic. First of all, a definition that was made within the database is, is a text literary or is it documentary? And the definition here is a literary text is, for instance, a magical handbook that could be reused. So the magical papyri, the PGM, would fall under this category because they were handbooks that priests had in the temple and or tome, and they could be consulted and used again and again, like reference books. Documentary magical texts, on the contrary, are magical texts that have been issued for an individual and are only important in the context of this individual. This could be, for instance, an amulet that has been written up for a person or a curse that has been maybe given also this person to take it for home and it is only relevant for this individual and it might have never been used again. So this is one dichotomy which one which we came up with and then there is a vast number of text types that fall under magical category, spells of all kinds. And then we are back to investigative um, and all the other branches of magic that I was showing uh, further on, investigative, reactive, transformative, preventive, so healing spells, curses, love spells, how we call them, which, is, which are actually sexual spells, spells to separate a man and a woman, and these so-called love spells make up a great deal of the magical papyrus of the whole corpora. What we, of course, didn't want to um, engage with is this dichotomy of black and white magic. As I said again, you always have to take into consideration to whom is benefiting what. A curse might be something that people would call black magic, but keep in mind it's beneficial to the cursor because he gets an advantage out of it, so it's good for him. Of course it's problematic for, for the victim. There is, there are words for magic in the ancient world, there's Mageia in Greek, Goetea, but those are all very problematic terms. For Egypt, there is the term Heka, just to have mentioned that again here. This is, of course, an indicator that we are dealing with a text type where magic Heka is invoked. And then we try to find good types of text to fill in all the records and entries that the database has. When dealing with magical texts, especially now in the age of digital humanities, we are dealing with a couple of issues here. First of all, it's a long time span in the ancient world where our magical texts are coming from, and the texts themselves are very hard to date. They very often don't have a date on it, such as letters have or contracts. We can only date them very often by context where they've been found, but a lot of fine spots are unclear. And the other way how we can date text is through the paleography. And this is very much problematic. You remember this if you think back on the curse of Artemisia, who might have written this up in her very own handwriting, which was not very experienced. And in the case of such hands, it is very hard to date them. The fine spots 
can vary greatly. A lot of the papyri, for instance, and ostrograph portraits that we have are coming from unknown contexts. Some are coming from archives, for instance, the Theban Magical Library, but those are the lucky cases. In most of the cases, or I would say 50% of the cases, we don't have fine spots. And this is in comparison to the rest of the material that we have from the ancient world, pretty problematic. It's a high ratio of, of objects that are unprovenanced. We deal with a lot of media, not just papyri and ostraca and, and metals of all kinds on which curses, for instance, have been rolled up. There are also very peculiar materials such as human bones, animal bones, camel bones have been found, but also of other mammals and other animals. And sometimes those, those texts are still rolled up, still rolled up amulet papyri, still rolled up metal curse tablets, and Gabi will tell you a little bit more on that in, in some of our next slides. And this is, of course, a great challenge for us to use our new Imogen techniques to find out what is written in the scroll. There's actually an ancient Egyptian literary text where a magician is able to read scrolls that are still rolled up, and we are doing this right now. So this is a very exciting time actually to fulfill this magic. There are a couple of variations that we're dealing with practices where they took place, as I said, very often in Egypt, the temple milieu, but we also had from late antiquity onwards in, in Greece, much earlier priests or wandering specialists that had their spell books that worked around and did their magic. Or in the case of Roman Britain and the curse tablets, we had not just specialists using and writing up curses, but the public themselves. And we have the the thesis and the argument that people actually learned writing or just were able to write these curses. That was the, 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 the driven purpose in order to learn to read and write, to curse your neighbor. And yeah, isn't that a, isn't that a great way of learning to read and write, a great motive. Several languages were used, which is also a great challenge for scholars. And this is why so many research on magic is happening since the 80s and not earlier on, because very often those texts are multilingual, Greek and Egyptian, that is the modic Egyptian and hieratic, so different scripts as well. And just to complicate this a little bit further, we are dealing with cryptography. That means words that we still can't decipher because we don't have a key to read these words. Or isopsephi, this is a mix of numbers and Greek letters playing with the values of the, the, the number values that the Greek letters have. This is deciphered, fortunately, but there's also wordplay, code switching within one sentence. And, and this means in case of Greek and Egyptian that you start writing in Greek from left to right, and then you insert Egyptian words which are written from right to left. So think about how this Craig must have organized laying down their manuscripts. And this not being enough, there's also clossing. That means letters that are inserted, commentaries that are inserted on the margin or on top of the lines. And if you do TEI, Epidoc encoding, you of course have to find a way to insert these very special characters and these uh, different languages. And the last thing that I'm going to mention, the last and final challenge is what we call vokes and Figura magica, those are magical words, apracadapa, some might say. And those are very often, in case of the magical fire, for instance, Egyptian epithets of the gods. For instance, the god Seth had a lot of these apple epithets. Nepuzulalet, and, and, and lots of vowels have been used. There is Jewish Hebrew texts. And this is all put together in a sometimes very confusing mix and written differently in a different font and a different layout. And all of this has, of course, has to be considered if you do digital editions of these texts and special fonts, special writing, or even drawings or a mix of drawing and scriptures. And this provides, of course, a couple of challenges if you want to code these in digital manners. And now we move on to Gabi with a couple of case studies of magical texts. Cool. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Francesca. So, um, so I should um, I should start again with a with a caveat um, here is that the three case studies I'm going to present um, just quickly um, are not um, completed projects. In most cases, they're not active projects, um, and in most cases, they're not my projects. So, um, so there's. Um, 
there's, there's, there's a lot of work in progress and there's a lot of potential and um, uh, interesting possibilities that, that I'll talk about rather than completed, um, um, completed projects. So um, for the first of these, um, the, um, the project involves this, um, this papyrus. It's, it's include, the text on it is included in the um, Papyri Graco Magica that um, Francisco mentioned earlier. Um, this is um, from the Oxyrhynchus collection. It's one of the earliest Oxyrhynchus texts um, published um, in, the, in the early volumes at the beginning of the 20th century. Um, it is basically, it is a um, excerpt from uh, a text called the Kestoi of Julius Africanus, in which in this fragment, he describes um, a, a, a few lines, I think it's 40 or 50 lines, which he claims were athetized from the, um, the beginning of the 11th book of the Odyssey when Odysseus goes to the underworld. Um, because he, he, you know, he, he argues that you know, some of the, the Hellenistic scholars must have seen this text that was originally written by Homer and decided that it wasn't, it wasn't you know, serious enough, it wasn't um, uh, noble enough, and so they removed it from the official text of Homer, and that's why we, we, we've lost this, this text. But he preserves these, these lines. Um, and the, these, these lines of text are when Odysseus is basically um, slaughtering the black sheep into uh, a trench in order to raise the ghosts of the underworld. Um, and what he, what Africanus claims was removed from this was 40 lines of magical prayer um, addressed to the ghosts to, to make them rise from the underworld. And what we as, as, as um, 20th, 21st century scholars can see is that this is obviously um, exactly the same language as appears in the um, Greek magical papyri of the uh, late antique period, and it clearly can't be um, pre-Christian, it clearly can't be um, Homeric in, um, in content. And it's a really interesting text for that, for that reason, for all those different layers in there. And so the project um, that I'm describing, this is a private project being carried out by my colleague um, Flor Herrera Valdez, who um, is, uh, and the project is currently on hold as, as she's currently on maternity leave, but she's, um, she's looking at various different digital um, methods. Basically, um, she followed the Snoikesis Digital Classics module last year, and pretty much every single method that was mentioned in that entire course, she, she can see ways in which that can be applied to her text. So she's looking at ways to create a digital edition of this text, which will cross-reference um, out of the text, both to the Homeric text, um, in other versions of the Homeric text, and to the papyrological edition, the images and so forth of the, um, of the magical text. Um, she's interested in tree banking the, um, the, the Greek text, um, which is as, you know, full of all these weird languages, all these weird characters, all these weird um, proper names of, of demons. There's Jewish demons, Egyptian gods, there's um, Babylonian gods mentioned in there. It's all, it's all real, real, you know, complex mix. I'm looking at the grammar, looking at the authorship, looking at um, possible um, ways in which this could have been composed. Um, aligning translations um, is, is a particular translation um, translating it as magic, or is it translating it as a literary text, as if it were part of the Homeric epic? Um, looking at the various different methods and, and strategies taken, taken by translators. Um, and in particular, looking at the, at the Epidoc um, um, encoded um, digital edition of the text, um, there's all sorts of weird features in the text, the, um, the apparatus criticus, the, the, the different linguistic elements in there, textual criticism that is needed, um, corrections, um, strange characters, strange paleography, um, how to incorporate commentary in here. And of course, talking about the physical features in the history of the papyrus. This is true of, of almost any text that is preserved only on papyrus. Um, but in this sort of thing in particular, um, that any clue you can get as to the understanding of the text from its physical state um, is important in the way that it, it, it very often isn't for literary texts, for example. Um, so this is this is the work that um, the, the, the floor is doing on this um, on this edition, and, um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing this this produced. I think the um, the important thing to note, and this is this is something that I'll, I'll try to come back to with all three of these case studies, and the important thing to note is that um, 
the I don't think this project could be carried out in this way without the sorts of digital technologies that, that we've talked about in this program. And conversely, I think the um, the, issue, the particular issues with a magical text that we've talked about um, do provide unique challenges to um, to these digital methods. So I think it's a really, really good example um, of, of a digital approach to magic. Um, and you know, maybe maybe next year when the, the thing is closer to being complete, complete floor will come along and tell us about it herself. Um, the second case study I want to talk about, and this is again not, not work that I um, have done um, or have any, any involvement with directly, um, but it's someone else who has, um, who has studied in the Sonokis' um, uh, digital classics um, material with me last year. Um, and this is, um, this is involving um, uh, Greek amulets. Um, these are very often um, texts carved in, into uh, gemstones or other small um, valuable or semi-valuable um, surfaces. And this, um, this, is, this is one example. You can see that the text is written very, very small. This obviously had to be massively magnified in order to be able to be um, shown and photographed on screen. I don't have the exact dimensions of this. Um, I, should, I should point out that none of the images I'm going to show are necessarily texts that, that are being worked on in this project. They're just examples to illustrate some of these issues with um, Greek amulets. Um, the, the texts are very, very small. Um, the, um, the writing is, is quite constrained by the, uh, by the medium. Um, and they can be um, they can be full of you know all the same sorts of magical um, language that um, that we've um, talked about already. Um, some of them have um, really interesting physical features. This te this text, um, as well as the text itself, having some of this very interesting um, magical magical features such as palindromic um, uh, words appearing throughout it, um, and some of the interesting paleography. Um, issues partly related to its small size, um, but the, the three dimensionality of this is really, really interesting. It's almost impossible to photograph in a single image because it is this hemispherical shape and you can't, um, you know, you can't read all of the text from any one perspective. Um, so they, they, their physicality is an absolutely essential part of, um, of the object. Um, and the third really um, important um, feature of these amulets is the, re the interrelationship between text and image. Um, the, um, the text on this amulet cannot be read without an interpretation of the image that it interacts with. Um, and this, this sort of thing is absolutely essential to, to this sort of, um, to reading this sort of um, work. So we really do have to do an art historical study as, as much as we do an epigraphic study um, side by side in this. Um, and so one of the things that, um, that um, um, Barbara Roberts, whose, whose project this is, wants to do with these texts is to use um, uh, digital tools for studying paleography. And we talked, we had a presentation in Synochesis in the spring um, about the archetype tool for paleography, um, where you can start to create a database of, of categorized um, letter forms. Um, where you take an image like this and you can say these are five alphas in this image and you have another thousand images where you pull out any alphas you find in all of those. You categorize them by whether or not they have serifs, whether they're angled, their, their crossbar is straight or angled, whether it's an uppercase or lowercase alpha, all these other sorts of issues. Uh, I don't mean uppercase or lowercase, I mean whether it's epigraphic or cursive um, um, and so forth. Um, and you can then start to, um, to do various research and queries across your corpus. Um, based on based on this sort of work. So as I said, this this is work that um, that, that Barbara Roberts um, um, is thinking about. Um, she's about to start a PhD on this in 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 October. So so this is all completely speculative at this point. Um, but um, so the various digital methods she's um, she needs to to think about are include the um, how to work with this sort of corpus at scale, um, and in particular, across the various boundaries, the boundaries of material, the boundaries um, of geography, the boundaries of language, and the various other um, different um, things that, 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 that come into um, the complicating and, and making this, this corpus difficult, um, in which, you know, having, having, having digital um, methods for this sort of um, querying and organizing of the corpus will be will be very useful. The physical features um, are extremely important in this kind of thing, even more so than in, than in papyrology, as we were saying a minute ago. I mean, the collection metadata, um, many, many amulets are not necessarily found in, in primary contexts. So it's not so much their um, provenance that's interesting, but 
but you know how much they have travelled, where 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 we have found them, I and mean, how we can attempt to categorise their their origins based on based on their, their material features. And um, the interaction of the image and text that's something that we've we've talked about before, and that's um, the sort of thing that um, that digital methods can really help with. And the paleographic analysis is extremely important for these texts. We we have issues of authorship, not necessarily of particular. Um, scribes, but of schools of scribes, and potentially being able to date hands, or to talk about, you know, this this is this is potentially an Eastern Mediterranean as opposed to Western Mediterranean hand. These sorts of things, or you know, can give us all sorts of help in categorizing these texts. Are we talking about expert gem cutters, or are we talking about people who are carving their own um, things? Do we have itinerant magicians who may be professionals, but not professionals from from um, from letter cutting? Um, what can this tell us, the, the paleography tell us about the transmission of these texts, the amount these texts have, have traveled, how, how long the, um, the, um, the formulae and traditions within the text survived. We, we see uh, magic can be very, very conservative. We see the same word being used th for thousands of years. Um, again, looking at the religious iconography, um, what does this tell us about beliefs um, and how, how magic um, in, interacts with religion in these cases, um, religious terminology, medical terminology, all these sorts of things that, um, that, that, that come out of these texts and, and, and things that the, this, the detailed study of the physical nature of these texts can, can help us with. Um, so I think this is, this is going to be a fascinating um, project and again um, I hope Barbara will come and tell us about it when she's done some of the, some of the research a bit more. Um, and so for my final case study, this is, this is a project that I was involved in myself, but, um, but the caveat that it is not an active project stands um, because this is a project that was planned um, with a, um, a, a team of people several years ago, um, but never actually took off, so, so it never actually happened. Um, and this was a project to work with some curse tablets um, that are currently held in the British Museum. These are curse tablets from Cyprus. Um, they are not on lead like most curse tablets. These curse tablets are on selenite, which is a, um, as you can see, I think on these photographs, it's a semi-transparent um, uh, soft stone. Um, so it flakes a bit like um, slate. And so there's very, very thin sheets of this which have been written on. You can probably just about see the writing on, on some of these darker fragments here. Harder to see, but there's writing over every single one of these fragments that um, that's seen in this. Um, the most complete fragment, um, the most complete text that we have from this particular collection um, of 100 or so fragments in the, in the British Museum is on this. Um, this one, which is made up of um, four or five um, fragments, um, it's partly partly missing. It's still you, it's it's readable. Um, a little bit hard to read on this slide, but it is it is just about readable. Um, this text, but this is the, the the best text of the entire the entire collection. Even that, I haven't fully read the whole text um, yet. Not not even all the parts that I think are readable um, have I have I read and deciphered off this of this text yet. Um, so one of the things we wanted to look at with this was how better to image these texts because you know as we say they're very very hard to read they're very very hard to photograph um even standing you stand sitting over them with with bright lights and you know microscopes um and so forth it's very very hard to read um the, um, the text the letters are sometimes only a couple of millimeters high um so one of the things we looked at was using um, an imaging method called optical coherence tomography which is um, something that is designed for the imaging of the inside of the human eye for um, for uh, medical diagnostic purposes, um, and so we we did some experiments with this, and it was very promising. And I had I had a collaborator at um, Moorfields Eye Hospital who was um, who was very interested in using some of their um, hardware to image these curse tablets, um, and we had some really interesting conversations about how um, how we might put together the funding bid to um, to get this project um, funded, and um, I was looking at. Um, you know, arts and humanities funding, and um, as they were talking about having to modify not the hardware but modify the software that they use to to um, to read the scans from these OCT um, imaging devices, um, I was asking, you know, could this could this work potentially be of value to them as eye surgeons? And he said, yes, absolutely. You know, so I, I was there thinking to myself, you know. Ding, ding, ding! This is this is an impact case study, right? I'm saying this is this is a piece of classic and archaeological work, which could could benefit um, medical research, right? I mean, it, it could, you know, we could be reading ancient curse tablets and helping to avoid children going blind at the same time, right? So um, this 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 is a perfect definition of of, of impact. 
Um, and, and then he said something which, which totally made my jaw drop, but probably shouldn't have done. It was naive of me, but um, he said, yeah, this is impact for us too. Our funding bodies, the medical funding councils, they really like it if, if our work can be used in other disciplines as well. So the fact that our work is also useful to archeologists is also impact for us, which makes sense but was astonishing to me that you know someone who's helping to stop children go blind would care that archaeologists can also use this stuff. But like it's you know it's not about how important it is. Of course, impact is about whether it has unintended uses that can that can go beyond beyond you know beyond what you're working on what, what you're paying for. Um, so so this this group of curse tablets we have as I say about a hundred fragments, probably I think twenty four tablets or so. Um, they're fragmentary. They're poorly provenanced. There's a description that says that they were found in a, you know, in a hole in the ground. Um, but um, about, uh, as I say, about a hundred fragments were sold to the British Museum in 1891, um, and about 20 fragments were sold by somebody else to the Bibliothèque Nationale in um, in France in in, um, in 1889, um, and those fragments are of exactly the same collection um, and in fact there is not a single tablet um, that is attested by one or more fragments in Paris that is not also attested by one or more fragments in London so this is clearly the same cache that someone divided and and then they took off and sold to two different places so who knows what where the hell they came from um, so they're unpublished partly because they're so hard to read um, and to get anything out of. Um, but one of the most interesting things about them, as well as as well as well how one would go about imaging them, um, will be that once you have read them and um, and annotate and, and you know, publish the text, um, is that this text then contains this vast prosopographical and onomastic resource. There are over a hundred individuals named in this corpus, we believe, from, from, from as much as we've been able to read. Because they're magical texts, unlike in, um, in usual ancient Greek practice where people are named um, uh, patronymically, these people are, are all named matronymically, so half of the names we have in this corpus are of women. Um, this is probably the largest single um, cross-section um, of a small community like the city of Amethyst from a single period um, for, a, for a, you know, a small subsection of the third century CE in, in this one town in Cyprus um, that, that we have for, for any city outside of Athens and Rome. So it's, it's, it's a beautiful piece of prosopographical thing. There's a lot of, a lot of these texts are political. They're, um, um, you know, attacking generals, attacking, you know, governors and so forth. Um, so that there's all sorts of really interesting uh, major historical work that could come out of um, of this corpus once once someone you know does the work of, of publishing publishing it all. Um, and sadly, that person's not going to be me because, as I say, that 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 um, that project that, that I've just described never actually happened. But for the potentials, the digital potential um, for working with this material, I think is is vast. Um, and I, I look I look forward to seeing you know when someone has done this work. And I think this would be true. These three tiny snapshots, case studies. I think this sort of thing would be true of 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 many many um, magical magical corpora. Um, the sort of digital approaches one could take to them. So, back over to Francisco. Okay. Yes. Okay. So, oops. Yeah. Finally, as last part of this session, we would like to present you a couple of resources, apart from the project that we mentioned and apart from TM Magic, which serves as the big hub for all our sources from the ancient world, as far as people are entering them and as far as they are already entered. There are a couple of specialized collections, databases in the web that we just like to point out here for you. There are a couple of curse tablets that are basically published and also published as full text and with images online. There's the curse tablet database from Rome, Britain at the University of Oxford. There is another one hosted by the University of Cologne with magical text from the Levant area and our colleagues in Spain are also working on on making the magical papyri, the Greek magical papyri available. And there's a couple of ongoing projects right now in Chicago, in Heidelberg, 
and elsewhere. If you like to know more about that, it's just really easy to ask us in the discussion session or later on. Another project dealing with curses, the Defixiones, the tablets, is in, hosted at the University of Magdeburg. It's not taken offline, it's just that you have to register. It just came back online very recently. You have to register to be able to be to be able to use the materials, who is cursing whom and, and what are the texts about. They have a very large uh, data set. Our friends and colleagues from the Coptic Magical Project at the University of Würzburg are hosting a very new project dealing with Coptic magical texts. They are going to annotate and edit the magical papyri in this ancient Egyptian language and related things. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, but um, just um, quickly to mention to um, to Monica, I think YouTube is currently still showing me, not not the slide. Okay, okay, okay. Oh yes. Um, I might I might just I might just share the slide as well, just to. Um, I don't know why. Until you, until you so if you're interested in reading more about practitioners in late antiquity and have an up-to-date huge bibliography, just go to our friends in Würzburg for the Coptic Magical Papyri project and then you can find a lot of further information that complements the session today. If you are interested in doing an exercise that belongs to the session of the marketers, there is always a problem to get in touch with Gabi or with me. And the idea would be that you could align and tree bank a text of your choice, an ancient magical text, whether it be Greek, Latin, or Egyptian, whether it be multilingual and with a translation, and you can get back to us and be able to do the alignment in the software Ugarit that was presented earlier in, in um, Synoikis's adding relevant metadata and comment on the magical techniques that are relevant and that, which makes them so exciting and, and, and so important to comment on them in a digital humanities for an edition. So feel free to do that and, and please contact us beforehand. If, um, we can discuss your selection of texts. All right, so this was the session. So now we're looking forward to your questions that you might have. Francisca, can we um, can we suggest some um, some preliminary texts that people might might sometime where people might go to look at um, to choose texts from? I mean, I guess TM Magic would be one place. It's a good idea to start with, for instance, the corpus of the magical papyri, the PGM papyri, Greg K. Marika, in the edition of Prizendans and the, the Transliteration of Bets. And don't worry if this is too much name dropping now, this will be all in the slides and we will also put the bibliography and links to things online. So the magical papyri could be a starting point, but also other Egyptian texts, cursed tablets, and so on. And if someone is keen on, on working with unpublished material, that might be also possible, but the starting point might be published material. So they would they would get they would go to the book they would get the book out of the library which has both the um, the the Greek in the present dance and the um, the translation in the beds and they would they would transcribe them themselves and and align those exactly right okay how many of how many of the magical texts in TM Magic have the text online it's over three thousand entries and they have text yes okay. the virtual text. It's potential for a lot of film works. Mm, cool. Cool. Okay, so we have uh, a question in the chat. <clears throat> yes, friends. So uh, I have Oh yes, dream interpretation is of course a very interesting thing. So Anise was was asking about and then commenting on the, the the interrelatedness of magical texts with human behavior and anxiety. Of course, there's something queer 
joking about, for instance, Roman Britain being an age of anxiety because people are cursing each other, especially when you have a look at the text from Ulay and Bath, where they try to curse people who have stolen their clothes at the bath. And imagine you've been to a Roman bath and all your clothes got stolen and you're coming out naked out of the outdoor, then you then you'd be really pissed and want to curse those individuals who've done it. Yeah, it's 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 in this interplay between the legal realm. How how would you be able to find the thief at the end? And then so cursing is definitely something which which comes to appeal. As for dream interpretation, this is more part of divination and and, and handbooks of, of rituals because dream interpretation has usually been done if it's done professionally by professional dreamers in temples. This is the tech, also the technique we sometimes call incubation. Or people went with the outcome of their dreams to professional dream interpreters at temples or to wandering professionals, and they had those those handbooks where they interpreted the signs that people saw in dreams for others. I would actually exclude this a little from from the magical text involved. And so here again, we come to the circular question of, of definition, don't we? Because the Greek magical papyri does include lots of divinatory texts, lots of, um, so these are magical handbooks. These are you know, things that we think itinerant professionals who among other things did, ma did magical um, things. They have lots of medical um, remedies. They have dream interpretation. They have divination. They have all sorts of things in these handbooks. So um, are we calling this magic because there are no magical papyri? Are we calling this magic because these itinerant magicians did this practice or is it just so it, it belongs in another category as you're saying and i agree with you that that it's not really magic it's something else the magicians also did on the side okay no the, the, the question of judicial curse tablets um i'm reminded um of a modern a modern example, the sort the sort the the, the kind of circumstances in which you might curse. Um, and as you say, you curse not not necessarily because you're completely powerless, but because you're really pissed off. Um, and this this is an example which was this happened when when I was writing my PhD. Um, my um, my flatmate had her bicycle stolen from right outside our house, and she didn't know anything about my PhD. But she had, I, but this this completely struck me that she basically made a curse tablet. Um, she took a piece of cardboard and she wrote on it um, to, you know, the wretched thief who stole my only means of transportation. I hope you fall off and break your bloody neck. And she nailed it to the tree outside our house. Um, that's exactly a curse tablet, right? You take it, you write something, you specify what the person's done wrong and what you want to happen to them, and then you nail it to a wall or somewhere. And ideally, you want the person to, to know that they've been cursed, right? And I don't want to say that the curse worked, but the next day, a different stolen bicycle was left on our doorstep. Well, that's karma at the end. <laughs> or however you want to call that, retaliation. Something, yeah. <laughs> A lot of um, the magical texts that, are still, that still have to be mentioned. So your friend wrote a very freestyle kind of curve. Yeah, yeah. And these practitioners were involved, we have a lot of formula, and this is what is helping us, especially when we're dealing with those tricky surfaces, those metal tablets of silver, mm. of lead, or whatever, which are so hard to read. And I really admire the scholars who do the hard work and work and decipher them. So. Formularies are really helping us to identify what is written in, on those problematic surfaces or what is written in the margins and helps us yeah. to provide us with additional. Yeah, my flatmate was more like Artemisia. She was she was <laughs> writing it herself and, and making up her own curse. Yeah. 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 I have another question. So I'm not an expert of ancient magic, but when studying epigraphy, Greek epigraphy, I remember also studying uh, curse tablets, and uh, I remember a corpus uh, from Athens, from the Canary Coast, uh, where they found the curse tablets in the tomb. 
And uh, an interesting component is the uh, prosopography. And uh, you, you mentioned that before, and this is also important for uh, digital methods or how do we want to encode these names, etc. But I think that here we have also an interesting uh, social aspect in the sense that I remember, for example, from this quote from Athens, we have these cursed tablets with voodoo dolls in the tombs, they were found there. And uh, we have names of uh, uh, politicians. Uh, of important people mentioning these cursed tablets. So I think there are here many interesting things concerning the people involved in these practices, uh, victims, uh, so the aristocrat aristocratic people, because there is, I know also uh, a discussion about uh, um, uh, people um, using these practices or at least involved in these things. So there are also there is also a prosopographical social aspect concerning magic. So again, I'm not an expert and of course here we are talking about many different texts uh, belonging to different cultures, but I remember this from uh, uh, the corpus of the fifth century of course, the Athens, fifth century. And I think also the context. So here we have the prosopographical references to important people, politicians, and also the context where we find these objects. For example, in this case, uh, in a cemetery in the Karamik Post in Athens, and specifically in, uh, in, uh, in tombs. So, um, of course, here I think there are many, ma many things uh, involved. And, uh, but I think that from a prosopographical point of view, if we can uh, read this text and uh, uh, comment on them, uh, we can get uh, very interesting results. Yeah. yeah, the political ghost tablets are among some of the most interesting though, you know, they are, the, these are the people, the sorts of people who, you know, were involved in trials that Cicero tells us about, that Demosthenes tells us about, these, you know, the, 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 the big high profile trials with the generals, with the archons, with the um, uh, senators or whatever were, were involved in, and um, and, and these people are named in, 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 in these curse tablets, you know, in, in exactly the same handwriting and in exactly the same rhetoric as people say the person who stole my cloak from the baths. Um, so, um, and, and, you know, we know from other ancient authors that people wanted people who were cursed to know about it. They, they might bury a copy of the curse in a tomb to send it to anyone, but they'd take another copy and they'd leave it on the person's doorstep, right? So the person knew they'd been cursed. So all these sorts of, um, all these, these sorts of things, and these were very high profile you know, and, and how did, you know, how did, I don't know, Pericles feel when he, when he knew he'd been cursed um, by someone? Did he care? Did he, you know, did his bodyguards just sweep it away and throw it in the trash? Um, you know, we have, we have stories of, you know, um, it was um, Germanicus, wasn't it, who was um, apparently killed by a curse. Um, um, and so, you know, there are, um, the fact that these things are, you know, that they, 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 they span all strata of society um, and yes. the things the things that can tell us about politics and who, so who was writing the curse that was presumably another high profile person yeah and superstition is everywhere so this is something again well, this is an old thing but and we still have today so it, <laughs> some, again it's not a new thing but an old thing and we still have this today in every uh, in many different cultures, of course, mm -hmm. cultures in other, in, in other cultures. So this is a very interesting thing. And when you read these texts, you find again uh, contemporary <laughs> things. I think, um, yeah, yeah. Magical texts serve, as Monica said, as a great source for new names, writings of names, variations of names. And as Gabi also mentioned. Affiliation works very often after the mother because not usually as we have it in contracts or other texts that one is identified after his father or both parents and the grandparents, it's basically the mother. And there's also some literature why this, this is the, the female side, the more magical side. This is something to do with rhetorical shields and then there's been some research on that as well. Yeah, we always like to have, of course, also new names and there are Ostraca coming from Greece, from Rome, from Egypt, which just contain names only. And this is very really hard to find out how these Ostraca have been used because they 
only have the names, might it be just a member of someone or might it be part of the ostracist models of this of this uh, yes. political ritual yes. where somebody was ostracized, literally ostracized from society and had to be exiled and had to go to another polis, or was this part of election rituals which used to petition, which have been also applied in, in oracles in order to come to a divine revelation. So how you can see how political rituals, and rituals is already a term that I'm using, how politics, history, and magical and religious practices are strongly intertwined and how this thinking in politics was in the English world much more magical than it is today but then again we have something that is called civic religion nowadays and we can see that our political customs and religion nowadays are also very much influenced by ritual practice yeah thank you for mentioning ostracism because i studied that for my graduation and i definitely remember that of course there are Austria, and we say Austria for ostracism from Athens, and we have an evidence for this. Again, so we are using this term magic, but as we can see, we have different uh, aspects, including politics, religion. So, uh, of course, now we, we distinguish between these different aspects uh, of ancient life, but uh, in the ancient world, it was a bit, uh, a bit uh, different. And so, we have all these uh, components, and we also have these. Uh, Public aspect of Ostraka, uh, who wrote this Ostraka, and we have definitely a language concerning, but not really magic, but he, he's trying to curse the victim or the candidates of Ostraka. Yes, this is an interesting uh, yeah. evidence. Yeah. I, I did. I did promise my colleague uh, Thelia Sanchez Natalias that I would mention her um, forthcoming project, which is a digital corpus of Latin curse tablets from the provinces, and um, particularly the Western provinces. Um, and this, these, these are slightly different because it's not so much um, the very political sort of cursing in in this corpus, as far as I know. And um, a lot of it is, you know, it's it's erotic curses, it's it's judicial curses, it's um, commercial curses. You know, people will curse. Um, curse athletes you know when they're gambling and these these sorts of you know very sort of weird sort of things that we um you know we might imagine um that um that again what, what collecting these things digitally um starting to build these corpora that you can then cross-reference you can cross-analyze you can you can connect them to other corpora you can connect them to trismegistos magic um you can start searching across them you can start doing all sorts of um, new interesting things and just just making them available because they're some of the hardest texts to find um, and even if you find them in you know in, in you know in an old edition or something in, in Greek and Latin then they're, they're then very hard to interpret um, they're very often not translated partly because they are so hard to interpret and translate um, so getting really good digital editions of this setting a standard and trying to get other people to put their texts in in a similarly open and transparent way I think is going to be really really important because the sorts of work we, we, we've talked about you can get huge richness out of studying a single magical text at great depth um, but the amount the amount of um, research and um, the, the kind of things we've been talking about the sort of political and monomastic we said you really want large bodies of text to be able to do comparative work across um, as we've seen with Greek and Latin literature generally the sorts of things that we can do now that we couldn't do 100 years ago or even 30 years ago because we have these massive corpora that are open and these um, methodologies and technologies Technologies which are um, able to be used on these things. Um, so, so starting this 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 act of, of creating these digital corpora of magical texts, I think is is, is going to be you know a really important um, stage in this work. And obviously, this work has, has started. And, you know, Francisca's work has has been you know an amazing part of this. But 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 carrying on going in that direction, I think is going to be very important um, and something else we should. You know, yeah. But next next time we do a session on magic. Yeah, sure. And, and this is something we already discussed with in our session about the chronology in the ancient world and ancient time, the same problem, because we have many texts, but uh, in order to find them, we have to read a lot of bibliography, which is of course important, but really we have to dig into uh, many papers and books to discover these texts. And again, we need a corpus of text where we have references to date and time in the ancient world. In this case, again, another important topic because this is not only about magic but about many many other things and again the digital corpora can help in this because we have the possibility to collect them to of course to collect pictures transcriptions and in this case this is really very, very helpful. 
And of course, we have to be very grateful to our colleagues and even Francisca because she has been working a lot for um, uh, collecting these texts. Of course, we need more people <laughs> because we have many texts. But this is uh, the beginning where we have now standards and ways for collecting them, for uh, accessing them. We have identifiers and just making these very uh, wonderful resource. Yeah. Okay, so now our time is over, unfortunately, because this discussion was uh, <laughs> very, very interesting. But anyway, we will have, I'm sure we'll have other sessions about uh, magic, <laughs> hopefully, next year. And so now, um, okay, our session is over. Uh, next week, we have um, a session from, with our uh, colleagues from Brazil, from Araraquara, uh, and it will be a session about comparative studies and the digital classicist work. So we will see uh, Greek and Portuguese and Brazilian sign language. So we'll have uh, an interesting uh, session. We have, uh, you know, that we have a strong community in uh, Brazil contributing to uh, synoesis and uh, in general to digital classes. Okay, for today, so that's it. We're going to add the link to to the slides and uh, you have the class outline and also an exercise and uh, many readings for ancient magic so thank you francisca thank you gabby and uh, thank you uh, to all who are in the also in our uh, in our hangout and uh, good night thank <laughs> uh, you and see you see you next week bye 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 see you next week see you